we were trained to work out, but what about working in? Whether the topics are mental health, meditation, spirituality, holistic medicine, or sexuality, host Josh Bienemann and guests have real conversations about balance and personal growth within the sports community. This is Locker Room Alchemy. What is going on? This is Josh Bienemann. I am your host here for Locker Room Alchemy, and welcome to episode number five. In this episode, we're going to talk to Jonathan Schultz. Jonathan and I have known each other for around 13, 14 years, not too, too well previous to this past fall, uh, fall of 2019. We played against each other in college. We coached against each other and really didn't like each other from what we knew of each other. We were both very competitive uh, people. And it wasn't until last fall we actually sat down formally for the first time and, and got to see that we were a lot more in common than we ever thought. Jonathan's full-time position is running a program called The Life Unleashed, and he works with uh, younger athletes all the way up to, through the professional ranks to CEOs. He works with uh, anyone in leadership positions or needs some extra motivation or emotional support. He works with those individuals. And then he also runs, uh, or he's the president for Diamond Boys Baseball here in Ohio. In this talk, Jonathan talks about being bullied as a child, both physically and emotionally, by teammates and, um, and also children at school, as bad as getting to um, some death threats. It's, uh, it's pretty disturbing to hear some of the, the things that were going on and that what parents allowed to go on. And he was able to um, persevere through that and uh, come out stronger. However, the, the transition, as it generally is, uh, was not the easiest one. And he recounts some of the, uh, the negative parts of trying to reclaim his, uh, his confidence and become a better man. So enjoy the story from Jonathan Schultz, episode number five. John, what is happening, buddy? How's it going? Pretty good, pretty good. Uh, glad you were able to join me here. You were one of the guys right off the bat, and like the first three or four guests that I had in mind coming on here um, were people that were around me, I guess, when I started to rediscover what I was passionate about, and you probably didn't know it, and I, I want to get into it on this podcast. I'll give you some nuggets that you gave me along the way uh, to help me, but I want to get you on here and hear your story because I know you got some more under the, uh, under the surface. So if you can give everybody just an idea of who Jonathan Schultz is and a little bit about Life Unleashed. Sure. Yeah. So I, I founded Life Unleashed, which is a performance coaching uh, firm a little over a year. It was something that, you know, having played for 25 years baseball collegiately um, and, and coaching for a long time, I just saw that there was this massive hole in our player development for athletes and not just, you know, with youth athletes all the way up. And unless you're a professional athlete, you don't have access to psychological and emotional development. We're spending so much time on the physical, which obviously is a necessity in what we do, but we're missing this entire block of we can get players to exceed what their physical abilities are. And so as I founded this, it was initially focused just on sports. But as I started the first couple months, I realized all of these are intertwined with life in every aspect, whether it's our jobs at school, our relationships. And so sports impact the outside and the outside, outside impact sports. And so really that's where uh, Life Unleashed really started to take off where it was focused on not only athletes and working with sports organizations um, and individual teams, but going to schools and talking on leadership and kindness and, and a wide variety of things. And then business, how to excel in sales with your interpersonal uh, talents with people how to come off the right way. But ultimately, it all comes down to how do we find fulfillment and purpose in life? And that we find it in every corner of our lives. And most often, though, we need to be led in that in the right direction. Now, the first thing that I want to tackle is, is probably the first thing that we, we got into when we um, met for the first time, I guess, formally ever, which was probably about ooh, last September, is that me and you, both catchers, both college catchers, uh, played up here in Ohio. Uh, rivals, not in the sense of schools, but in the sense of I knew who you were, you knew who I was, and we didn't like each other at all. It was just right. kind of like that on the field, he runs his mouth, I run my mouth, I think I'm the alpha, you think you're the alpha. 
And then that carried into us coaching against each other. It was a nice little rivalry. So how did, I, I guess, I, I went over my story a little bit in the previous episodes, but how did two guys that I guess you could consider to be selfish in college, um, maybe even if it wasn't as um, external to our teammates, but internally when we were dealing with our own shit, how did two guys that were so um, inner motivated come out the other end to be wanting to talk about this type of stuff? Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a really important, tr- you know, transformation. And I think everybody hopefully experiences in their life in one form or another. And so for me, um, it kind of starts early on where, um, you know, in middle school, I was bullied ruthlessly and um, to the point of considering suicide. And I had an amazing family and, um, you know, had the love and support there that really kept me from taking that next step. But it was just brutal on a daily basis. I was, when I was in eighth grade, I was about five feet tall, a hundred pounds and just you know, I didn't do anything to anybody. I just happened to be the target. And so as I grew and matured in high school, I was never Mr. Popular, but, you know, I really put a lot of that anger and the things I'd gone through that I'd held in a lot of, a lot of it. I turned it into this motivation on the baseball field where I took kind of this almost violent football mentality onto the baseball field. And so when I got in between those lines or I get in the weight room, you know, I didn't care if you were my teammate or you were the opposition. If you were in my way, I was going to run you over. And it benefited me as far as how I was able to get more out of my physical abilities than I otherwise would have. But at the same time, who I had become was, was, not, it was not the right path. It was not a good person. And so it took a while. And, you know, this is one of those cliche things, but I really turned the corner when I met my wife. And she, she really kind of gave me you know, the kind of insight that I'd never gotten before because she saw a different side of me and saw potential in me, but also saw that, you know, the way that I dealt with people or the way that it was kind of a one size fits all approach and coaching to players, it just doesn't work. It doesn't get the best out of them. And so, you know, in my early, my mid twenties is when really started to turn the corner and said, you know, this just isn't the way that things work. This isn't the, the way to get the best out of other people. And so, it was a process as anything is, but to where I am now compared to, you know, 10 years ago, you know, and how I relate to players, it just totally changed. But you have to sometimes have that mirror held up in front of your face and you're embarrassed and you're ashamed and you realize, wow, I spent that much of my life being that person. And, uh, but if you come to that moment where you come to the realization, you can make a change. I think those are one of those key moments in life, those stepping stones that really propel you forward to what your true purpose is. If you don't mind, it sounds like you've, you've spent a lot of time working on yourself. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking you have a pretty good, uh, pretty good optics on the bullying and the situation that happened when you were younger. But if you don't mind sharing some of the, the types of bullying, this is obviously before, social media and such, but maybe the emotional bullying or physical bullying. And um, I mean, maybe, maybe a story or two. Sure. Yeah. And, and, you know, one of the programs that I do with, with high schools and middle schools is called kindness, why it matters. And I actually came up with the idea as I was falling asleep one day about a year ago, um, just how much of an impact that had on my life and it shaped who I was. And so for so long, I, I really, felt a lot of the pain from those experiences. And I didn't really share with anybody, but it would come, I can hear a song from the nineties on the radio and it actually will bring back pain. I can drive past my high school and, uh, and I have these really negative feelings. It's like this big cloud shows up. And so there's all these things internally that you carry with you over time. And so in this program, the kindness program with schools, it's really sharing my story, but how we can turn it around, both the people who experience bullying, because it's never going to go away. That's part of humanity, unfortunately. We can minimize it. We can try to train people on the impact that it has, but it's always going to exist. So we need to give people on the other side, like myself, the opportunity to say, this is actually going to build you up to do things that are greater than you ever would have achieved. And so one of the greatest uh, lines that I've ever heard before, and it comes from Tony Robbins, is that life happens for us, not to us. And I think that's such an essential thing for us to remember when we're going through the most painful things is we're being shaped for greatness. We're being shaped to have an impact on humanity. And we have to go through things, unfortunately, like that, that are going to steer us in the right direction. But just quickly going back to you know, middle school, first through about fifth grade, 
was, was fine. And I was, you know, I had lots of friends and it was good. It was, you know, when you start to get in those teenage years, when, when things start to really shift. And so for me, it was, I always wanted to go to school. I loved school. And even when this was going on, I still wanted to go. And I, you know, every day was just hoping that that would be a new day. It would be a fresh start. And so it started with, you know, kind of the being ostracized stuff, but then it quickly turned into the physical because I was, you know, small and I was a late bloomer. Some of the kids who had grown faster, they, they like to use me as a punching bag. And so I would come home with bruises and, and my parents would see that. And um, that was a really tough time. I had a parent of one kid who I'd been friends with out in the parking lot. The parent actually told my mom that her son wished that I had never been born. Um, for no reason, it was just, you know, and for a parent to share that is kind of strange and still right. shocking to this day. But, and then one of the other stories is that one, one kid who was kind of the biggest bully of them all, who, you know, it was a lot of physical stuff. Um, he, his mom sent out an invitation for me to come to his eighth grade graduation party, but he told me on instant messenger that night that he hadn't sent it, that if I dared to show up, he'd drown me in his pool. So these were just a couple of the, you know, the things for years that I went through. And so, um, you know, it, it's really, you know, when I talk to kids after when I speak at high schools and talk to these kids, you know, there is just a, a level of hopelessness because it's like no one understands and there are hardly anybody that wants to actually talk about it because it seems like it's kind of this taboo thing, even though generations, you know, for all of human history, people have experienced this. They want to hold it in. And when they find somebody who's experienced the same kind of things, it's like this weight is lifted because they know that they're not the only one. And more importantly, they know that this is, that's not the end of their story. It's only the beginning. Now, one of my good friends who was on episode three, Chris Story, who I just met, <clears throat> um, maybe less than six months ago. He's very passionate on, on masculinity and bullying in sports. He's from uh, Bristol, UK. And he's a big proponent that where we lost touch with masculinity was when we got away from, I guess, the, the con coming of age for a male. So some sort of tradition that would signify, okay, now you are a man. You're going from the boy psychology to the man psychology. And like they used to do, like uh, he brought up an example of the lone wolf, where they would almost kind of uh, kidnap the 12 or 13 year old boy uh, and put him out in the environment. They would watch him. The elders would watch him. But the boy would think he was alone and would have to fend for himself. And once he got through that, there was a big celebration. And now he was a part of the tribe. And for males nowadays, there's just there's no point where we get to for most cultures or traditions where we say, OK, you know what? I have to leave the bullshit behind. And now I have to be, I got to be a man. I got to start contributing to the household. I have to start contributing to the tribe because, I mean, you can get lost in the sauce pretty easily these days. So do you believe that that may be a little bit of the disconnect? Yeah, well, it's the boys will be boys mentality, right? Which is saying, oh, that's just what boys do. Oh, that's what kids do. You know, they just have to go through. But that's not true. Once adults started allowing children to treat each other that way and where it became almost okay, right? Where it was just part of growing up and, oh, you need to toughen up. This is going to make you strong. That's not true. And we have athletes like Kevin Love and Michael Phelps that are coming out talking about, you know, the, the mental illness that they suffer from the depression, the anxiety. And these are people that are millionaires that have everything at their fingertips that are still experiencing this unbelievable level of sorrow that, obviously started when they were younger. It doesn't just pop up, right? It's through experience. It's through, you know, certain physical things that happen along the way and, and a wide range, obviously, that it can come from. But there's a reality that it's been covered up. It's been, you know, swept under the rug for generations where now we're finally coming to the point where it's okay for men to say they need help. It's okay for men to say, you know what? I have emotions. Sometimes I'm sad. Sometimes I'm depressed. I don't have to be tough. I don't have to be manly. I don't have to be angry all the time. I'm a human being and I have a wide range of sides and I should be allowed to share those. And more importantly, the people with, who are, have the pedestal to be able to share this coming out is, is talking to a new generation of young men who are going to say, you know what? I want to live my life a different way than people have been living it. And you hope that over time you get a pendulum swing. And uh, we start to see people, you know, treating each other better and, you know, a different view on how we treat each other, a different view on what a human being is supposed to be and a different 
a view on, on what a man is supposed to be. Now, with your wife, um, I've never had the pleasure of meeting your wife, um, but my wife was uh, similar to me. She was the rock that I was able to at least kind of drift ashore to and just cling to when shit was so bad, you know what I mean? So when nothing else was right, I could, I could hold on to, to her. She was the foundation. And both of us seemed like we struggled with the, the feminine side of the masculine, right? And understanding the healing side and understanding that we don't have to be Johnny Tough Nuts all the time and fend ourselves off and experience a lot of um, some of the effects within the locker room based on masculinity and not understanding it. So what do you think it is about women or feminine energy that allows us men to, to heal? Because it, it, you, you hear so many stories in history and, and just at the bar, anywhere, dude, any, any layer of society, man, I was a train wreck, but I, then I met my wife. You know what I mean? What yeah. is it about it that you think, um, maybe just in particular with your wife? Right. It's the tale as old as time, right? It's right. Having, that, having that good woman by your side. And so, you know, you can get into, you know, the, the philosophical, you can get into this, the, uh, the religious view of it. You can get all sorts of things. But I really, you know, my view is that men and women were created to need each other. We each have certain um, characteristics that, when combined, help us both to thrive. And when they're utilized together, become unbelievably powerful and unbreakable. It's when one side or the other or, or both stop providing that for each other that when you see those breakdowns, that's why, you know, obviously divorce and things like that, where you see this breakdown. But when you see these people who are just desperately in love, and I'm not talking about the infatuation stage, because we all know there's a big difference between that and real love, mm -hmm. right? But there, there is just this unbelievable power in being able to have this person by your side that provides these things that as a man, you aren't normally able to exhibit out in public, right? So you come home and you just, you know, you have your wife or whoever wrap their arms around you and you just kind of collapse and there are you, there's no one else that can provide that for you in the it's world, a right? It's, it's a surrender, you know what I mean? Absolutely. Take, and so, everything. and, and a good, and, and that good, support person, that, that good woman, they, when you see yourself and when they set standards for you, you want to live up to those. And so just being able to give them what they need makes you automatically become better. And if you choose not to, then it's never going to work <laughs> clearly. But there is, like you said, there's just this power that, that a strong woman will bring to, to a marriage and to a relationship that we desperately need. And we don't always have to be the strong one. We don't have, always have to be the one because if we are always the rock, if we are always, it's going to have ma massive implications on our health, both mental and physical down the line, just a matter of time. Now back to life unleashed. When were you able to have a clear understanding of all of the, I guess all the, the puzzle pieces that are square. This is how it was in my head. So correct me if I'm wrong, but, the puzzle pieces in your head that you're trying to formulate and all of a sudden you, you know what you want to do with the experience, right? The bullying, the emotional warfare you went through and now, okay, now I, I, I know what I experienced and I know how I can help change. What was the tipping point that pushed you outside your comfort zone with Life Unleashed to say, I'm going to leave normal corporate America and pursue my passion? Yeah, so... You know, there, there is one turning point that, you know, and it's, it's pretty, it, it works pretty well because it was Tony Robbins. It's back to, you know, anybody who has not had a chance to listen to Tony Robbins or see him speak, you know, you need to, because I had never really seen him before in my life, but Netflix has a, has a special, I'm not your guru, Tony Robbins. And so I sat down on my couch and I was, you know, for years, really, you know, I, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. I had worked for a Fortune 500 company uh, doing high-level legal work for six years. I was uh, one of the youngest people ever nominated to run for state senate in the state of Ohio. Um, I served as president of a baseball organization, which I still do. And I was working in the criminal justice system, and I just was not being fulfilled. And so I'm sitting one night watching the show. And it's about two hours long, and I am just glued. I don't know if I blinked the entire thing and I 
just the wheels started turning, but I didn't know what to do with that information at the moment. I went back maybe a week later and I watched it again and I just started taking notes and just the ideas just started flooding my head. And I realized this was my chance to have an impact on people because my greatest fear in life, and I don't have a lot of fears, but my greatest fear in life is getting to the end of my life and looking back and seeing that I didn't make any type of impact, that I didn't leave my mark. And I'm not saying that I need a statue. I'm not saying that my name needs to be in history books, but I want to know that I used my time to the best of my ability, that I left some sort of mark, whether it was on my family, on others, to the greatest possible level that I can. And so from that moment on, I just, I, I could clearly visualize what Life Unleashed was going to be, who it was going to impact, how it could grow and grow and grow and ultimately change the lives of people who otherwise wouldn't have access to this kind of information and this kind of guidance. And so over the first year plus, it uh, has been nothing short of a blessing. And, and quite honestly, the level of impact has gone far beyond what I ever anticipated. That's awesome, dude. That really is. Um, now, when we're starting to look at the, the weeds and starting to get in the guts of it, because that's what you do for a living, and I see it on a day-to-day -day basis with the, with the high school and younger athletes, what do you see if, I mean, if, and if we take the gloves off and we, we're not playing the blame game, but we're just saying um, because of our history and um, I guess what we've grown up with and seen, what are the problems that we either have to back our way out of in the sports community when it comes to emotion and it comes to the mental side of the game and um, or, or just polish up a little bit because I have some very strong opinions and um, I'm, I'm interested to hear if you just let it fly what your opinions are. Yeah, you know, I think we've had, you know, years and years and years and, and a couple of generations of coaches who just have been in that mold of I'm here to toughen you up. I'm here to yell at you. I'm here to scream at you. And, I, and somehow out of that experience, you're going to become a better human being. And that just has not been the case, right? You, it's not saying that that doesn't have its place in moments, right? But the biggest problem has been, and, and quite honestly, I've already seen kind of this, the, the separation point between our generation of coaches and the generation before us who are still coaching, mm -hmm. where they almost have zero interest in this stuff, right? And I understand it because we become such creatures of habit and we get comfortable in what we're doing. But if you look at somebody like a Terry Francona, who's been in baseball his entire life, you can see some things, you know, where, you know, he leaves somebody in way too long, too many games where they're struggling and they've been in the two hole for two weeks and they're hitting a hundred, right? So he sticks with guys sometimes too long, but he focuses solely on the human being, right? What is best for them? What buttons do I push? How do I make this the most memorable experience of their life and bring the most out of that human being? And that has rarely been the focus of most coaches. And there's some coaches, you know, throughout history, obviously, that people will praise and have done that. But it was so uh, far and few between for so long. And that was something that I did early in my coaching career because it's all that I knew, which was I'm just going to yell at everybody when they do badly. And I'm going to approach everybody in the same exact way. But when I started looking at each individual as what they personally needed from me, some of them need more of that in your face. Some of them need the arm around the back, right? And far everywhere in between. So it really comes down to if we are going to, because here, this is what it comes down to, right? Which is sports is supposed to be about people, relationships, and learning immense life lessons. And as coaches, we have the ability to provide that for these kids. We, we are one of the most powerful individuals that they will ever meet in their life, either good or bad, depending on what we do for them. And so when we look at it through that lens of the immense opportunity we have to impact their life now and for the rest of it, we need to do a better job in how we relate to them and how we treat them and how we teach them. Where do you think the, the change came? And I know this is a very difficult question, but I feel like we, we I, I just us as a society, always look at the moments, but we, we very rarely look at the two or three things that happened before the shift. So when you're talking about, I guess, the former generation, and not to shit on any generation of coaches or anything like that, we all have learned from each other. 
Um, and that's the way, that's the cycle of this. It's the beauty of the game and the beauty of life. But where do you think the tipping point where it was where the athletic community says, shit, maybe we got this wrong. Maybe we do have to embrace the, the, the pain a little bit, you know, the, the emotional pain. Um, do you think it was the athletes starting to come out or do you think it was just kind of a collective? I think you probably started to see more people who wanted to be more than a one trick pony as a coach. Let's call it that. Right. Where it's maybe there's more to this because as athletes, right, we're always looking for an advantage. How do we get better? How do we get stronger? How do we get faster? Well, the best coaches are always looking for ways to improve and to do things that no one else is doing. So all of a sudden, there became this race to find more information, right? Look at the technology that is available to us now as coaches, right? Mm -hmm. All the different things that we have at our fingertips. Now, it costs a lot of money, but it gives us unbelievable information that we never had before. Even when in our playing days, we had nothing like this that's available now. Well, then you had coaches that were, you know, going to psychologists, were going to people in that field and saying, how can I get the best out of these people just like you would? And how can I make my players faster? Well, how can I relate better to my players? How can I get more out of them? How can I personalize and customize the experience for each one of my players? And I think that's where you start to see was a combination of this social unrest where it's like, I don't like to see young kids getting yelled at by a coach who's red in the face at a youth sports game, or even on the, you know, on prime time and from millions of people, when Nick Saban's lighting somebody up, there's a lot of people that just don't like that. And so I think it's a combination of those two things where, again, it's not removing that from the equation. There is a necessity for it at times, but there was more of a willingness to say there might be some other avenues we can take to get better at this coaching thing. Now, in, in your world, in, 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 in your head, so it's 2020 right now, in 2030, 10 years from now, if we – do a great job as, um, as an adult leadership team within the sports community, both within the U.S. and globally. Within your mind, what does, what does youth sports and, and college sports look like in 2030? Yeah, well, I think more importantly, most importantly, is you're going to see the next generation of young men and women be better prepared for life. Mm -hmm. because I think that that's, that's what we're doing, right? How many of these kids are going to be professionals? Hardly any, right? That's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to give them a great experience, give them a chance to play at the collegiate level and, you know, and again, teach them these life lessons. So I think that they are going to have this experience where they're going to look back and be like, wow, I learned so much about myself and so much about one another because it wasn't just this you know, tough environment where everybody just had to be stoic all the time and take the beatings, you know, not physical, but, you know, the verbal beatings, can, all that. Can I interject with that real quick? Yeah. Do, you, do you think some of that has to do with, um, <clears throat> now this is getting, <clears throat> excuse me, a little maybe in the weeds of it, but with World War One and World War Two and Korea, the Korean War and just some of the, the hardships that our uh, grandparents faced, do you think that's why we take on that stoic mentality when it comes to athletics. Like it's, it's almost like military. Yeah. yeah, it's generational. Absolutely. Because you look back at the fifties and sixties and the standard, you know, husband was the guy that came to work. And when he got home, the wife had his food ready for him. The kids had to leave the living room because there was only one TV. Dad didn't barely even said hi. The kids pat him on the head and shoo them away while he sat and watched TV. And that was, you know, and I, I can say that because uh, you know, there's family, um, you know, of friends and of my wife that, you know, they, they have experienced that. Thankfully, we didn't have that, you know, in my family, but that, that's kind of the, um, the stereotypical view of that time period. So you're coming out of that generation, right, mm -hmm. where we're still being impacted by that kind of viewpoint today. And it wasn't that it was, you know, a social view different of how we view the importance of women in the household and in, in life in general, obviously, and kind of the role the man played where he was just the breadwinner and the protector. And you, and that was it. He didn't have to be the consoler. He didn't have to be the one who handled the emotions of people, the hard things you're going through. That was mom's job, right? And so th that did get carried for, for decades and decades after the point. But I think you, again, you start seeing that shift where, you know, I have three kids and I show them, you know, unbelievable amounts of love more than they want a lot of the time. But if, if a, a dad from 
50 years ago saw this, it would be like, whoa, they would be like overload. Mm -hmm. And not everybody, obviously, but you know, that was just kind of the thing. So I think you're right. And that there was this, this generational view of how we handle each other and what our roles are that are slowly over time being broken down. And to be fair to our generation too, and uh, for, for people listening that don't know our age, we're, we're millennials, we're in that bucket. Um, what do you think our blind spots are when it comes to our own development, things that maybe we haven't, we, we said, yeah, dad, yeah, mom, um, growing up that we millennials kind of uh, can call ourselves out on too when it comes to, I guess, the development and the continuing growth of this. Yeah, I think, and the one thing that you can see from baseball Twitter, right, all the time is that everybody thinks they know everything. Yeah. And if you, and one of the problems with Twitter in general is if you disagree, then it's the name calling, then it's a, you don't know what you're talking about. You know, you only played to this level, you only coach to this level. It's, it's just this nonstop, you know, insults being curled at people if you don't happen to agree. The thing that we have to understand is that we have so much information at our fingertips that sometimes it isn't just one right way. And I think that's where everybody is always on this mission to be the one right person. And then on the opposite side, and I've seen this a lot with coaches, is they're still trying to reinvent the wheel because they want to come up with something new and innovative, as opposed to saying there are certain truths to sports, right? Mechanically, you know, mentally, decision-making, there are certain truths that will always be the same, right? You haven't watched anybody hit on their head yet, but there have been some people that probably have tried and tried to teach that, right? Mm -hmm. That's an extreme version, but it's, it's always trying to reinvent. So let's not try to go be crazy. Let's always be innovative. Let's always look for new ways, but we have to look to the past, look at what made people successful. And there's a reason we're here at this stage now is because so much of that still works today. Well, before we head out of here, man, what are you working on right now? I know you're a busy ass guy and along from your full-time job with Life Unleashed and, and um, overseeing the Diamond Boys organization, you, you have a ton of different not-for-profit projects going on. So what are you passionate about right now that maybe we can send some of the listeners to check out some of your stuff? Yeah, my big thing that I'm working on this summer and it's going to roll out this fall at schools is something called the Lighthouse Project. And so what the Lighthouse Project is a, a lighthouse, you know, its job is to bring light into the darkness. And there's this great deficiency in our world in real leadership. And real leadership isn't the in your face, the yelling from the mountaintop stuff. It's the moment, day to day stuff, where every single one of us have this opportunity to change the trajectory of someone's future just by our daily interactions with them. And it goes bigger, you know, and beyond that. But the Lighthouse Project is going to be a leadership workshop and retreat that's going to be done at schools and can be done on an individual basis, too, that really teaches young men and women how to forge their path for impact in life, both today and in the future. So that is my uh, next big thing. And, um, you know, just really looking forward to getting back to normal here soon uh, once schools start opening up, sports get back to uh, to doing what they do and, and kind of being able to really make an impact. Because I think you look around our world today, you look at what's going on with riots around our country, you know, just everybody's very angry and scared and confused. And I don't think there's any greater time than now to reach out to each other, to find a way to how can we get back to the basics, which is how can I help my brother, my sister? How can I help my neighbor? How can we just start to love one another, not try to assume what other people are going through and look at each individual as just that, as an individual, and if we can start to do that on a wider basis, I have no doubt that the world will change in the right direction. It'll never be perfect, but it's our job while we're here to make it as close to that as possible. And that's really my mission. Preach, brother, preach. Um, any particular, and I'll put this in the description for this episode, any particular um, ways you want people to reach out to you if they want to learn more about Life Unleashed, whether uh, for them personally or for a group or a team? Yeah, they can go right to the website, which is thelifeunleashed.com. It has everything from sports to business to life coaching to, you know, athletics. It, it's, it goes on and on. So all the contact information is there. There's videos. There's, like I said, an endless amount of information. So be happy to talk to anybody one-on-one -on -one in groups and teams, whatever it might be, you know, really to 
look beyond sports as just a sport and look at sports as how we're going to impact our lives now and in the future. Well, I appreciate it, John. Good to see you. And uh, once we get at the other end of this uh, quarantine or whatever and we get to see each other on a baseball field, I'll, I'll give you a big hug. Absolutely. I can't wait for that. All right. I'll see you, buddy. Take care. Thank you so much for tuning in. Please help raise the vibe by sharing this podcast with friends and family. For more real conversations, show notes, and to connect, head over to LRAlchemy.com. Until next time, peace.